without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker today, Peter Stair, on, uh, who will be talking on catalysis and energy utilization. Peter. So now I just have to figure out again how to get this thing started. Fortunately, I don't have to figure it out. So um, I'm Peter Stair. Um, I'm both at Argonne and at Northwestern. So I think that's the reason why I'm speaking first. I guess I'm supposed to be an example of what we hope will uh, uh, blossom uh, between the two institutions. Um, I work in the area of catalysis, and so I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, the first thing is, what is a catalyst, or what is catalysis? So catalysis, as this uh, uh, busy text up here says, uh, increases the rate of a reaction and directs a reaction towards the products that are desired. Uh, many reactions uh, can form a host of products, uh, many of which are not ones which we uh, desire. And uh, a catalyst's job is uh, to make what we want and not what we don't want. Um, catalysts are generally classified into two categories, heterogeneous catalysts, which are typically solids. So the automotive exhaust catalyst in your car is a heterogeneous catalyst. Um, homogeneous catalysts, so the, uh, where the catalyst is in the same phase as the reagents. And uh, the beautiful polymerization catalysts that Tobin Marks has developed are, are uh, examples of these. Um, catalysis is very important in the fuel and chemical industry. Something like 90% of all chemical processes are catalytic. So uh, most of the stuff in this room wouldn't be here if it weren't for catalysis, except maybe the wood. Uh, what is the role of catalysis in energy, uh, specifically? So uh, I like to think of it as uh, that it has three roles. Uh, the first role is to transform energy sources into useful forms. So right now, we get much of our energy from crude oil and coal. Uh, so you can't put a lump of coal in your car and drive it. But if you operate on that lump of coal appropriately with a catalytic process, you can make a fuel out of it and drive your car. So that's where the catalyst comes into play. Oil the same way. It's sort of a muddy sludge that comes out of the ground. Uh, catalysts are also used to uh, make processes energy efficient. So I mentioned the chemical manufacturing and that something like 90% of the processes are catalytic. Uh, the chemical industry actually is a, a large consumer of energy in this country, and without catalysis, it would be an even larger consumer of energy. Uh, the third area is uh, to reduce or eliminate emissions from energy use. In particular, combustions emi combustion emissions is the most prominent one, I think, that most of us think about in terms of, uh, for example, the converters in our cars. If we had converters that we could use in diesel vehicles, then we could all drive diesel cars, and we could satisfy the EPA regulations, and we could save a lot of fuel. Uh, but we don't have catalysts that meet the EPA, EPA uh, uh, regulations, and so we don't drive diesel cars, and we use more energy than we would otherwise uh, use if we could do that. Um, the catalysis that I'm particularly interested in is uh, called selective oxidation of alkanes, selective oxidation. So what is that? Well, so one uh, example of selective oxidation is to take an alkane, such as methane or ethane, or I see I've got the subscript wrong here. Um, so that's supposed to be, never mind about that. Um, uh, methane and ethane to either methanol or ethanol. So why would we want to do that? Well, one reason we'd want to do that is uh, that, as we know, uh, ethanol is blended in our fuel now, so it's a fuel. So if we take ethane, which is a component of natural gas, convert it to ethanol, then we have a transportation fuel. It's estimated that we could make something like a 25% impact on the transportation fuel inventory if we could do this chemistry, and we can't. So uh, it's a big deal. 25% uh, is uh, uh, very significant. Um, another kind of selective oxidation is to convert alkanes to olefins. So why would we want to do that? Well, there's a huge demand for olefins, particularly polypropylene, and there isn't enough uh, supply. And it's estimated that the growth in demand for olefins will outstrip almost everything else, including the growth in demand for energy. Um, so right now, it's just done by cracking, a very energy-intensive process. These numbers over here tell us that this is endothermic. We've got to put energy in to make this happen. We could do it catalytically, but we don't impact the energy consumption. 
If we could do it oxidatively, if we could couple oxidation to this process, we can actually make it exothermic, and so we don't have to burn fuel to make this process occur. The problem is that instead of doing this, what normally happens is combustion. So we need a catalyst to create a selective process. So here's an example where there, here are two uh, reactions with the same reagents, and unfortunately, nature sends us this way, which we don't want, rather than this way, and this is where we need the catalyst to deal, help us with this. Okay, so my specific interests are in two classes. How do catalysts work? So I like to characterize them. Mostly I'm interested in solids, and so I want to see what the nature of these solids is. Um, I want to know what the catalyst is, what its properties and performance are, what is the reaction mechanism. I'm also interested in the synthesis of catalysts. I'm interested in how to make catalysts that are easier to understand uh, instead of big, complex, uh, solid materials. And how can I control what I make? In other words, if I make something, can I get something specific in terms of the catalyst instead of just uh, a gamish? So um, I've benefited from the connections at both institutions in being able to push this forward. Uh, in particular, I'm, this is just a list of the sort of benefits that I've recognized from being in two places. Of course, the people is the main thing. Um, wonderful people to inter interact with at both places. Uh, the other thing is, of course, the capabilities. And Argonne, as you all know, has very unique capabilities in terms of equipment. We all think of the APS in particular, but there are other things that Argonne has that other places don't have that are useful for uh, the kind of science that I'm interested in. So um, let me give you some a little more specific examples. Um, here's a set of materials. These are uh, vanadia uh, uh, clusters and uh, monomers uh, on some kind of a support. So this is a catalyst. This is a catalyst for uh, selective oxidation. And uh, the problem is when I make a catalyst is I get all these things. And I want to, first of all, figure out what I have and then ultimately I'd like to come up with a way of making uh, a, a specific set of uh, molecular species. So uh, we find that this uh, material behaves differently as a catalyst than this one does over here. So the first thing was work done at Northwestern where we could identify these different uh, components. Then as a result of work at Argonne, uh, we figured out a way to selectively make uh, one set of those species versus another. And we make use of the, the technique of atomic layer deposition. So now we have a synthesis, a material synthesis technique that uh, we learned at Argonne. And by doing one cycle of this, then we make these monomer species. If we do a second cycle, then we can make polymers. And we can make the polymers as big as we want by doing sequential cycles. So we learned to do this as a result of the interaction with Jeff Elam uh, at Argonne National Lab. All right, in addition, another way we can make them is to make the assembly ahead of time. So in this case, I, the assembly occurs as a result of a reaction that takes place on a surface, one at a time. Alternatively, I can make that assembly as a molecular entity and then attach it to the surface. And this work is done in collaboration with Tobin Marks. So here's where molecular synthesis comes into play. Still making more or less the same material but there are quite significant differences in the details of what you get uh, depending on how you make it. Then we have to figure out a way to look at these things. And in particular, uh, Raman spectroscopy is a very powerful tool, especially for looking at these kinds of molecular systems. And as a result of uh, an instrument which was uh, constructed at Argonne uh, in a laboratory that they made available to me, we have a wonderful instrument that's uh, able to distinguish these different forms of the vanadia and tell them apart and even say how much of each one there is. So now we can get a real picture of what this vanadia species looks like. But now in order to interpret the vibrational spectrum we need theory and as a result of a collaboration with Larry Curtis at Argonne, we've now identified that these are in fact the vanadia species that exist on the surface. Not the cartoon that I showed you before. The cartoon was just somebody's imagination with no real uh, physical evidence for the specific uh, structure or molecular form. But as a result of the collaboration with theory and the vibrational spectroscopy, we now know that vanadia exists like this. 
The next question is, is how are these differing from each other uh, in their catalytic performance? And we're in the process of uh, doing that work uh, practically as I speak. Um, we've also been able to make other interesting materials as a result of collaborations with Oregon and Northwestern. So here's an example of what we call a nanolith, a catalytic nanolith. So it's a little honeycomb structure with tiny cores uh, that we coat with a catalytic material and run a reaction. So here's a reaction that's one of these selective oxidation reactions. And what we're doing is we're taking this molecule, cyclohexane, reacting it with oxygen, and desirable product would be the olefin, the undesirable products would be benzene and carbon oxides. We want to understand how this reaction takes place, and the vanadium that I was showing you earlier is the catalyst for this reaction. Okay, so what have we learned? We've learned that the uh, system is quite complicated, that we start with cyclohexane and oxygen, and we make all three of these products. And what we find is, depending on the uh, nature of the vanadium on the surface, we get different branching into the different product pathways. So the black numbers here correspond to, to rates, uh, all normalized to this number one here. So uh, in, in this particular case, uh, between the black number and the red number, the rate going in this pathway actually goes down. The difference between these is the nature of the vanadium. In the black numbers, the vanadium is mostly in this monomeric form. In the red numbers, the vanadium is mostly in the red form, in this polymeric form. So the nature of the vanadium changes quite dramatically the way this chemistry proceeds. Interestingly enough, the conventional wisdom has always been that polymers are more active than monomers. And if you look at these numbers, you see that reflected all over the place. The red numbers are always bigger than the black numbers, except for this pathway, which is the one that we want. For this pathway, the red number is actually smaller than the black number, and we still have yet to figure out uh, why that is. It's, so it's an interesting scientific question, but it has some relevance to a real problem. Okay, so I want to just conclude by acknowledging all of the colleagues that I've uh, interacted with uh, to, uh, sh uh, in the work that I showed you in this short talk. So the faculty at Northwestern, Tobin Marks, Harold and Mayfair Kung in particular, uh, postdocs, Hak Sung Kim and Zili Wu, uh, graduate students, Hao Feng and Stacy Wegener. Hao Feng is now a postdoc at Oregon. And the Oregon staff, in particular Jeff Elam, Larry Curtis, and Z Peter Zappel, uh, for the synthesis and the um, uh, theory uh, contribution to this. And then postdocs, Hao Feng and Joe Libera. So that's uh, my little presentation. that was 